Welcome, formal welcome to Kabbalah of the future. So when I was in touch with Rabbi Crisp about topics and about ideas, so some topics that caught my eye, well, you can probably guess, the ones that we're doing in the series, there was a theme, a common theme that I realized that really, really drew me to these themes. And that is, these are all the stuff that could otherwise be thought of as science fiction. In other words, the concept of time travel, right? Teleportation, the idea of body regeneration. This is the stuff of science fiction. This is stuff that can't really happen, right? This is the stuff of movies. This is like back to the future meets um, the Terminator, right? Back to the future being the time travel, right? And Terminator being like that robot that regenerates itself. You're with me, right? Yes? All right. The point is, these are, these are the things that are out there in science fiction novels and in movies and, and crazy wild stuff. But as we're going to see over these next two weeks, these are ideas that have their space, all puns intended, in science and especially in Torah, in Jewish wisdom, and in Kabbalah. What would happen, I ask you, if Isaac Asimov, Albert Einstein, and the Ariza walked into a bar? That would be an interesting conversation, would it not? My friends, welcome to Kabbalah of the future. This is now. This is now. I am so grateful that we have Rabbi Usher Crisp, who is an incredible scholar, to join us for these two weeks to present these incredible topics. It's quite an honor. Um, Rabbi Crisp is a native of Vermont. Am I correct? A native, I don't know how to say it, Vermontonian. I'm just adding extra syllables at the end. So forgive me if I totally made that up, which I really did. So a native of Vermont who is a world-renowned scholar, a world-renowned mystic, a futurist, which I totally love that description. Futurist, if every, if I want to be a futurist. A futurist is so cool. Someone who looks at what's going on and sees things that could be going on and understands the deep insight behind it. Rabbi Crisp has worked as a futurist and consultant dealing with disruptive technological trends in the spheres of automation, nanotechnology, sustainable energy, and biomedical breakthroughs. He has spoken around the globe, and we are lucky. We are grateful to have him speak with us. Well, I guess I'm based out of Atlanta. Some of you are also based out of Atlanta, but hey, welcome to the Zoom reality where we can connect from wherever. I know we have quite the national crowd from various states around the country. So I want to welcome all of you to the Intown Jewish Academy, Kabbalah of the Future, and Rabbi Crisp. Without further ado, and Toronto. How can I forget Toronto? Because of the, it's so close. I feel like, I feel like we're right there. I feel like we're right there. A state, a country, a border, a passport. What what are these things amongst friends? All right. So without further ado, welcome, and Rabbi Crisp. Please jump in. We are going to give you a round of applause. Everyone's muted except for me. I will, everyone, round of applause, but my audio will be audible for all to hear. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, please. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. And I, I have to say that given the topic, um, it's sort of perfect that we're doing this right now on Zoom. Uh, because uh, Zoom is in a certain category of technology that really uh, is underscored by the overall theme right now. Uh, time travel and teleportation have to do with the ultimate death of distance. Um, and we can think of there's like sort of spatial distance uh, that, that separates, let's say, Vermont from uh, Atlanta or, or Toronto or wherever you may be. But we can also think about sort of temporal dif distance, like, you know, the amount of distance we are from the 1980s, right? That's also a kind of uh, distancing effect that's going on. And, and yet uh, a variety of, of sort of technological theorists and philosophers have pointed out that now everything has been swallowed by the now and all localities have gone global because of technologies like Zoom, where you can instantaneously connect and see people from around the world. 
you can have this uh, simultaneity event that's occurring. Uh, and likewise, because you can now sort of like traverse archives that allow us to sort of search through and f glean all kinds of insights into the past. And now we're also projecting uh, more and more into what the future might be. Uh, as, as, uh, as some have said, the best way to sort of predict the future is to invent it. That's what really being a, a futurist is all about, not just uh, sort of like conjuring it uh, in, a, in a way that is, is uh, prophetic and, and guessing, but like trying to actually create the future that you want to live in. So we have, we have better access to space and time, I guess you could say, than ever before. So I want to do a little time traveling with you. I tell everyone I'm an amateur time traveler. Um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so I like the future, but I also like the past. And very often they're oriented uh, within one another. And I'd like to look at um, amazing impact of some of the concepts we're going to uh, address uh, in sort of like a number of historical uh, happenings and events throughout history, some of which are in science, some not so much in science directly. Uh, and, and to begin with, I want to sort of say that, what, that the fundamental text that is sort of the basis for this whole talk is, is a text that comes out of a Kabbalistic work known as the Zohar, it's sort of the classic Kabbalistic uh, uh, work that many people know of. Of course, there are thousands of works of, uh, of Kabbalah. But there's a very specific text of the Zohar. But in order to, to sort of give you a sense of how influential the Zohar has been throughout history, I have here an academic uh, book that is actually called, you can probably see that, Kabbalah in America, um, uh, Ancient Lore in the New World. And there's an entire chapter in here uh, about the uh, impact of the Zohar in, in early America, even amongst believe it or not, the Puritans, who you would never, uh, never guess. And uh, amongst enthusiasts, uh, we found that the, um, the founder of Brown University, one of the uh, pre-colonial colleges, and, and also uh, the seventh president of Yale University, Ezra Stiles, um, was absolutely obsessed with uh, he uh, Hebraic learning in general and Jewish mysticism in particular. Uh, such that, and I, I will now quote from the book, on December uh, 27th, uh, 1769, congregational, uh, a congregational minister and future president of Yale College, Ezra Stiles, wrote a letter of request to Benjamin Franklin, who was living in Lon London as a colonial representative. Within the letter, Stiles asked Franklin to acquire for him a number of esoteric texts that were presumably not yet available in the New World. Amongst these, Stiles listed, and I quote, Zoar, with Latin translation, if be had, else in Hebrew alone. So there are several letters, um, and these letters exist in, in uh, the Beinecke Library at Yale, uh, between Ezra Stiles and Benjamin Franklin asking him, you know, new Ben, when are you going to get me a Zoar and send it from, from uh, over from England? And in fact, a few years later, he does receive a Zoar. And amazingly, um, the Zohar that he gets uh, for Styles is known as the Zoltz, Zoltzbach edition of the Zohar that was printed uh, in 1684. That's the edition that ends up being sent over. And I, I happen to own a copy of it. Um, so this is, this is an original edition of the Zoltzbach Zohar that very likely Benjamin, we don't know for sure if Benjamin Franklin was ultimately the one who procured it or not. It's a little bit ambiguous. From the letters, but this is the edition that Styles had, and was learning and writing about, about and it was, of course, was influencing all kinds of things in the founding of America. Uh, and in this text, there is a a very interesting section of the Czar. I have it actually marked here. You're not going to be able, to, of course, read it online, but it's talking about the very first verse uh, in 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 the Torah, or it says, "Brachet bar elokim et shemayim beitar." It's in the beginning. God creates the heavens and the earth. And it actually talks about a, a secret Kabbalistic name that is encoded in this very first verse of the Torah. And it has to do with the expression for the heavens and the earth, et hashemayim ve'etaretz. And this word eight doesn't really get translated into English very nicely. It's often understood to refer to the 
the set of all constituent objects within whatever the term is that is designated after it. So Eta Shemayim was like the heavens, but it would really mean the set of all things in the spiritual realm. And Eta Aretz would be the earth, but it really includes the set of all objects in the material realm. So there's some, some connection here between the material and the, and the spiritual. And in Hebrew, it's rendered in four words. So it's Eta Shemayim Eta Aretz. Literally, the heavens and the earth is how we translate. It doesn't quite capture what's in the original. And the Zohar, in the, in the, in the bookmark place I just showed you, says that there is a, a, a hidden divine name that never appears explicitly anywhere in the, the Torah. It always is, is as an acrostic. It's somehow ciphered into the text. And that name is, is Aleph, He, Vav, and He, four Hebrew letters. It's a divine name, Aleph, He, Vav, and He. And it's actually the first letters of these four words, Eight the Shemayim, the Eight the Aretz, and the heavens and the earth. And what's very interesting is that it brackets both the heavens and the earth and all that is within them and sort of like holds them together. It's a way of, of, of binding, if you were, if you will, the heavens and the earth. And we're, we're told that the secret of this name is that if you add up the numerical sum of its letters, Aleph, He, Vav, and He in Hebrew, which is one and five and six and five, it equals 17. And 17 is most famously called, uh, it referred to as, as a uh, numerical illusion as the word tov, good. It's the go go goodly name. In fact, this is the secret of what's called the shame tov, the good name. And many people may know that the founder of the Hasidic movement, the Baal Shem Tov, is literally the master of the good name. And so the master of the good name is whoever knows how to to utilize this name that brackets the heavens and the earth, who's able to bring together the spiritual and the material together, the soul and the body, to couple these things in a very important way. That's that is our definition of good goodness, if you if you want to understand it uh, pure and simple. And what's even more beautiful, and this is brought in other uh, texts and allusions, the entire four words. Now, if you don't just take the first letters that that is sort of like encrypted this name, Aleph, Hey, Vav, and Hey. If you take all four words, Eight the Shemaim, Eight the Aretz, it equals 1,499, which is the gematria miracle uh, value of the expression Torah to Hasidut, the teachings of Hasidic philosophy. So everything the Baal Shem Tov came to teach is about collapsing what seemed to be the two most distant things we can imagine the distance between the heavens and the earth, the distance between the ideal and the real, the distance between the material and the spiritual, between body and soul, we need to collapse those together. And uh, it overcomes in that collapse, the limitations of the earth or our material reality. We have all kinds of limitations just, just being here on the earth by itself, but when we're, we're married to the heavens, then there are new possibilities that open up in this text. So this is a text that uh, Benjamin Franklin and Ezra Stiles certainly saw. Uh, it's commented on at much greater length in later periods of time. For instance, uh, there was the, in the generations that were concurrent with the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Balatanya, Rabbi Schneer Zelman of Liadi, uh, is a figure known as Yehuda Leib of Anapoli. And he actually wrote an approbation, Haskama, uh, at the beginning of the Tanya. And he himself has written an entire text, which is called the Or HaGnuz, which really means the hidden light. And it refers to this expression, Or HaGnuz Litzadikim. There's like a hidden light for the righteous, seemingly that's going to be revealed in the future. What is this hidden light for the righteous? And uh, we find that this hidden light is all about the secrets of the Shem Tov, the goodly name, which is this name, Aleph, Hey, Vav, and Hey that has four Hebrew letters to it. And everything that has to do with time travel and teleportation is very much connected to this name. If you wanna know where it comes from in Jewish sources, it's very, very important that this be the, the, the uh, point of inquiry. And there's, like I said, an entire text on it. It actually goes through the entirety of the Torah and shows all the places where this name shows up. And every time it manifests in another encrypted fashion, it comments on some other aspect on it. So there are book-length treatments of this subject. 
um, and over over you know many many centuries, uh, the czar harkens back, of course, thousands of years, and 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 and, and it's. Uh, pr pr primordial form. And I showed you a copy of it from 1684. It's first printed in 1558. So it gives you a little bit of some historical context from where uh, this is all coming. So how, how, does, how does this name really affect and uh, understood in terms of uh, time travel and teleportation or the death of distance? We have to go a little bit more into the death of distance. And it, we, we affect the depth of difference through making connections, through connectivity. Of course, now we like great internet connectivity and we're the first time connecting the whole world together. It's, it's uh, anticipated that by 2025, through efforts like Elon Musk's Starlink system, uh, we'll finally connect the last 3 billion people on Earth so that all of us will be instantaneously connected. But never before in history have so many people been connected. And the, the very uh, uh, idea of connectivity is related to what we call uh, the tzaddik. So we said this is a or genuz le tzaddikim. This is like a hidden light for the righteous tzaddikim or tzaddik is a righteous person or the righteous plural. And really the definition here of a righteous person is like a connector in chief. That would be how technologists would probably talk about this one, the connector in chief. And connector in chief is like, like getting everyone plugged in and connected both between each other. We have to have uh, interpersonal connections that we have Ben Adam uh, like between one person and another. But we also have Ben Adam Lamakom that we want to connect to Hashem simultaneously. So there's sort of a twofold connecti connectivity, connections on the, on, the on the earth and on the heavens and between both of them. And the better the connectivity, the more, just like on Zoom, we collapse the distance so that it seems like there's no distance between us whatsoever. I can see you as though you're right standing in the room with me. And the delay is is not no longer no, noticeable. There's no latency in the delay, which affects not just space but time, because space and time go together. And historically, there's a whole class of technologies that relate to this. We often refer to them as tell technologies. Tell meaning at distance, as in telegraph, telescope, television, um, telephone. All of those are tell technologies that that affect this. And Zoom is just uh, further outgrowth of that thing. And we're going to see more and more and more of it, especially now as we're not just connecting people, but we're we'll soon be having uh, trillions of IoT devices, Internet of Things, which are connecting all kinds of objects. So your microwave can be uh, connected to your cell phone, and your doorbell is connected to your laptop, and your toaster oven is connected to your refrigerator, and they're all connected to your Amazon Prime account, so you can have whatever you want on demand in real time. Uh, the, these, these are the connect, connectivities that are uh, unifying the world, sewing it together in very, very important ways, and are transforming our understanding of everything. So it's also very fitting that we are in the 30 day period before Passover, before Pesach. And of course we have this notion that 30 days before uh, Pesach, Passover, we should start already learning about it, especially the, the halakha, the, the laws that are related to, uh, to Passover. So here we're gonna learn a little bit about it spiritually. And to do that, we're gonna quote something very deep from the uh, famous Kabbalist known as the Shalah HaKodesh. Uh, and he's known really for his very famous work, Shnei Luchot Brit. Uh, and that's first published actually the year the Baal Shem Tov, the, or the most famous publication, I should say, there's one earlier one, but the most famous publication of it is in the year Nachat, which is 1698, the year of the birth of the Baal Shem Tov. So it's very associated with him, this, this text, for very important ways. The Shlah himself lived from 1555 to 1630. Um, uh, Yeshiao Horowitz was his name. And he says something very interesting. He says that when we look at the whole episode with the Egypt story, that we can look at Egypt as a historical locale, right? It's a place situated in history. So it was there then, it's not here now. And yet we need to try to jump over that distance 
we're enjoined to think about ourselves every single day as having gone out of Egypt. And even the, the rehearsal of the whole re-dramatization rehearsal of the whole narrative every year is sort of to uh, drill into our psyche the notion that this is a ongoing phenomenon. So as much as it seems anchored in a historical event in a geographical location that had a, like a social and political dimension to it, it is ultimately speaking to something that is uh, much more universal. So again, everything local becomes global and the globalization of the Egypt concept, according to Shala, is hidden in the etymology, which of course many who've studied a little bit of Hasidut and a little bit of Kabbalah, know a little bit of Hebrew, know that the word Mitzrayim for Egypt in Hebrew comes from the etymology, etymology Metzer v'Hagbalah to be confined and limited in some way. So this state of confinement, and we're, we're enslaved we're in this confinement, is not just, uh, again, the geographical and historical. The Shalah says that the ultimate confinement has to do with Bria itself. It's the, it's the world, it's cre all of creation. How is all of creation confining? Because of its finitude. In other words, we have an existential condition of finitude that limits us. And part of that limitation has to do with the limitations of space and time themselves. I can only be here now. I can't be everywhere at once. And uh, I also can't be at all times. I'm mortal. I, I, I live in this time and my arrow of time marches forward from past to future. And I seem to be uh, taking up uh, uh, residence and domiciling in the present tense only. So I can't seem to move very easily my, my very life and existence into the past or future. I, I'm sort of seem riveted to the present, if you will. So just like I'm anchored in my location and that's sort of being space bound, I'm also sort of time bound to the present. So the nature of our finite reality, the construct of the world is this larger overarching concept of uh, Egypt, Mitzrayim, that we have. And along with that, sometimes the Shalah says that the Egypt that we experience is the Guf Gashmi, is the physical body, which as opposed to being limited within the horizons of the world, being in the world, I'm now just anchored in this, this space, this more restrict, even more restricted space, the prison house of the body, if you will, uh, the situatedness that I have in my body, that I see things from over here, and that this body also experiences uh, aging and so on. So we'll, we'll pick up more on this latter meaning in next week's class where we talk about the body 2.0. And this includes sort of looking at radical life extension and perhaps overcoming aging disease and even death as something forecasted uh, in, in, the, in the Torah. But today we're looking more just at space time and so in the ultimate exodus of the future, and this relates very much to Mashiach and Gula, to redemption, the messianic age, we see that the ultimate exodus is actually an exodus not just from a specific situation, but it's actually an exodus from even the limitations of all space and time. In other words, the ultimate tell technologies that are related to the future are time travel and teleportation something very, very deep about, about that that is going to uh, transform uh, everything as we experience it. And we're tasting it. We have this idea of sort of tasting Shabbos uh, before Shabbos. So we're like getting a little bit of a taste of time travel and teleportation, even right here on Zoom, because it's playing with our ordinary sense of spatiality and our ordinary sense of time, how quickly we're able to accomplish things in very important ways. And that's only gonna become more and more heightened as everything seems to be accelerating exponentially, faster and faster and faster. So the meaning of even a, a few moments of time is rapidly changing for us. And of course, we see this historically also with the Baal Shem Tov who masters this good name that's the secret of it all. Most of sort of the miraculous stories about the Baal Shem Tov have to do with also overcoming the limits of space and time in some way. For instance, he's very famous for being able to achieve feats of what are called kvita taderek, like literally like the, the contraction or skipping of the way. 
And it would be like a classic example of what we might think of as like teleportation. The ultimate teleportation would be like from the heavens to the earth, right? The, the spiritual and physical to move between those two, two states. But it seems like there are many, many stories of the Baal Shem Tov that he goes out on these journeys that should take a whole long time. And then uh, usually his wagon driver falls asleep. Uh, and then he, they wake up moments later and they're like in another far off region of the Pale of Settlement uh, in, in white Russia. So uh, the Baal Shem Tov is constantly being recorded as having these abilities. Of course, he's sort of our consummate tzaddik, our righteous individual who has this connector in chief capability. So he's connecting all kinds of remote regions of Jewry together, going around and visiting them and having to make haste to be able to make these connections. He doesn't have connecting flights, but he's doing it somehow with this, this spiritual name. Uh, and likewise, he seems to have the capacity to play with and manipulate time as well. This has to do with time, what we might call time dilation, as opposed to time travel, which is just changing your, the, the, either your perception of time. That would be sort of like the simple and easy way of doing it. That's like Einstein saying that an hour on a park bench, ne ne park bench next to a, a pretty girl is not the same as a, an hour doing, let's say, low grade clerical work. It's not the same hour. That's a subjective sense of time as we register it, even though it's uniformly captured on a, by a clock. So uh, what's going on here? The Baal Shem Tov is playing with time actually is much deeper than that that from uh, the measures of time by others on their ordinary clocks, let's say, uh, they would find him, his students would, would come into his, his chamber and he'd be deep in a trance and uh, a few moments would pass by and they would rouse him out of his trance and they would find out that uh, during those few moments, he was able to ascend to like a higher spiritual plane and to learn Torah for 15 years. So to compress 15 years of Torah learning just into a few moments that was passing in sort of ordinarily er, ordinary earth clock time, that has to do much more with a sort of time dilation feature that we have. And of course, we're starting to now open up and understand that time may not be uniform throughout the universe. Depends, for instance, like how you're moving, if you're parked next to the event horizon of a black hole, all of those things will uh, affect time. But this is another deep secret that's interwoven with the Baal Shem Tov, uh, this, this idea of time dilation, somehow being able to manipulate both space and time, that they're not a rigid immutable framework, but rather can be uh, subject to our influence depending upon what we're doing within space and time. Space and time become, as in uh, Einsteinian relativity, they become, uh, active dynamic actors uh, and will be changed based on what's occurring within them. So this is very, very important. And we're starting to get a little bit of a, a sense of this in the world today. Of course, the, the uh, first examples of this, if we wanna go back now in uh, early history. So we look in the Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin and it talks about how there were three who experienced this Kvita uh, to Derek experience, this uh, skipping of the way. Uh, and there's also a, a Midrashic literature. Midrash is sort of like a repository of ancient rabbinic thought that is, uh, it could be likened, I guess, to deleted scenes or direct commentary. That's how I like to term it anyway. Uh, there are some who say that there are 10, 10 who experience this sort of teleportation uh, experience, some say it's three, and actually there are two different idioms that are used. One is, is uh, kvita to derek, this is sort of like the skipping of the way, and the other one is kvita uh, ha'aretz, the skipping of the earth, or like the contraction of the earth. They're not really the same thing. What's the difference between the way gets shorter versus the earth gets shorter, right? So that's a really an interesting uh, problem right there, and so we might say one is like if you're um, if you are looking at a fixed background or frame of reference from which you measure your journey, like the earth itself, and the earth as the backdrop of measured space changes, then that would be sort of akin to what we think of as, as warping space. Of course, 
uh, Einstein's uh, 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 revolution in the world uh, that totally overthrew Isaac Newton's understanding of space and time being totally fixed and inert and um, uh, uh, unchanging due to conditions of what's happening with them is, is completely thrown out the window. And we see that there are instances where space, it's, space itself, like a fabric, flexes it gets warped. And this is even how Einstein understands gravity. So the reason that the, the moon is stuck in orbit around the earth is because there's like this sort of like, like a bending of space here that it's getting caught in the, the, this actual distortion or warping of space. And there are actually uh, serious scientists today that are asking questions like, could we warp space? Could we use uh, antimatter? It sounds like out of Star Trek, but could you use antimatter particles to, for instance, fold space in front of you while expanding it behind you? And it seemed like it was pro prohibitive to do that because the mass energy required to, let's say, fold space to be one tenth of its actual distance um, would be something like the mass energy of Jupiter, something like 314 times the size of the Earth. I don't think we're going to go burn Jupiter as energy to uh, uh, affect spatial travel. And then uh, came along something called three plus one numerical relativity, which includes a uh, sort of variant uh, uh, view of things where uh, amongst uh, other discussions, if the warp bubble around your spaceship that you're creating with this combination of uh, matter and antimatter particles uh, was in the shape of a, a bagel or a donut, uh, then uh, you would only need the mass energy of a Volkswagen bug. So uh, much smaller than the planet Jupiter for design. So there's, I guess, I suppose, hope still out there. So the serious people entertaining this to wonder if it is actually possible at some point in the future to be able to uh, warp space to get where we, we want to go. The other possibility has to do with uh, an Einstein-Rosen bridge. These are two Jewish scientists but, uh, that are writing about this in the early days of of both quantum mechanics and as we are understanding better, both special and general relativity. And Einstein-Rosen bridge is more popularly known as a wormhole. If space is like a fabric, could I get a hole in that fabric uh, that would allow me to move back and forth from one, one space to the other? So I might, I might, for instance, think that if I have to go, you know, from one end of this to the other, in a linear fashion, it's gonna be very hard, but let's say I've got this hole here punctured and I wanna just fold space. So now I just go right through the hole. And it takes me immediately to this very, very distant spot that normally I'd have to traverse the whole region to get to, this is our wormhole. And believe it or not, this is discussed also in Kabbalah. It has to do with the 39 prohibited types of work or malakha, av malachot, uh, that we can't do on Shabbat. And a lot of these are learned out from the uh, architecture and functioning of the Mishkan, of the port portable sanctuary, which incidentally, much of the writings of Isaac Newton were about uh, Jewish mysticism. He was obsessed with Kabbalah and also had read sections of the Zohar in Latin translation. And the overwhelming majority of Isaac Newton's writings are on mystical speculation. He believed uh, after learning Hebrew, which he did, that if you could understand precisely all of the different elements in the construction of the Mishkan of the tabernacle, that you could understand all the physics of the universe. And the majority of his manuscripts actually today that talk about this, thousands of pages, are at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So uh, it's important just as another little more time traveling historical note uh, to pick up on that. And so the, the, the specific uh, uh, malacha that we want to uh, address has to do with what's described in the Talmud as hakroa al minat litpor, which is to tear the, the fabric of the uriot, the, the curtains that are surrounding the, enveloping the tabernacle, the sanctuary, in order to sew them. So likewise in, uh, in uh, Kohelet and Ecclesiastes, there are the, uh, the, the Koach Etim, the 28 times, like that famous 
uh, pop song from the birds, like a time to be born and a time to die. So, right, like time for war, time for peace. So eight the craw, there's a time to tear in a hole, like a wormhole in your in your fabric. Uh, eight the poor, and there's a time to sew, to stitch it back up, close the hole that you have in these these garments. So both both are are, are spoken about. And that's something you can't do on on the uh, on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to, uh, I guess, open a wormhole. It would have to already be pre-existing, if you will. But it actually talks about getting a wormhole in these garments. And actually, there are ten of these garments that are uh, there for the sanctuary, plus an eleventh that goes over the other ten. So it's very, very interesting that uh, we have this idea, Ota Or Kaselma Nota Shirmayim Kyuria, that God basically enwraps light like a garment and the whole heavens, the sort of spatiality of the heavens is, is like this curtain that we have. It's the fabric of the universe, the fabric of space. And that fabric can get a hole in it. It allows you to travel through and move from one place to the other uh, very rapidly. So this is theorized in, in physics as what's called an Einstein-Rosen bridge. And what's perhaps even more interesting for anyone who knows something about uh, super string theory, there are uh, many uh, attempts now to unify all the known physical laws in the universe. And uh, some of those are, come under what are called guts, grand unified theories. Most popular perhaps is uh, super string theory. It has several variations and many of them have been sort of uh, themselves subsumed into an even higher level theory called M theory, something uh, put forth a lot by uh, Ed Witten at, at Princeton. And M theory conjectures that the universe has 11 dimensions to it, 10 of space and one of time, which is exactly the number of uriot of curtains that are on the tabernacle. So all the space-time dimensions potentially can have tearing and sewing according to this uh, Kabbalistic notion. So if you're, if you're basically teleporting where you're moving between two places without traversing the intervening distance, that's only shortening the way, it's not actually shortening the earth, the standard of measurement, like a fixed physical standard of measurement that's in between the two. So the two techniques for collapsing uh, distance would be either warping of space, that would be kvita ta'aretz, like the, the skipping or contraction of the earth, um, or because it actually is an appeal to some external quality that's going on, or this idea of sort of teleportation, which could be either through perhaps a wormhole as a shortcut, or there's actually another phenomenon that I want to speak about, which is called quantum teleportation. We'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. But who is the figure, the first figure, I mentioned there are three that are spelled out in the Talmud and Tractate Sanhedrin, the three that experience this phenomenon. We're not going to deal with the other seven, but uh, the three that experience the, the phenomenon. The first one is Eliezer, the servant of Avraham, and he goes out to uh, find a shidduch, a, a, a spouse for Yitzchak, the, the son of Avraham, goes out to find Isaac, a wife. And uh, as I like to say, it's not that we had uh, uh, online dating in those days. And it was very common that you would meet at the local watering hole or well. And so he goes out on this journey and it's expressed the yom yatsati yom ayom bati, the day that he goes out is the day he arrives. And in the Medrash, it says it should have been a 17 day journey, but he accomplishes it in just three hours. That's, that's one of the things. So first illusion that we should pay, be picking up on is that this hidden name that has to do with collapsing space time, uh, time travel and teleportation is the name Tov, the, good, the goodly name, which equals 17. So it's 17 hour journey. That's, that's an example of a sort of self-reference that we have in the text right there. So it collapses somewhat. And uh, what should have been a multi-day period is all happens on the self same day. But then further, when he's recounting how this happens, he talks about how he comes upon the well and he meets Rebecca Rivka. And he, he's, he's talking about the Havo Hayom El Ayan. I have come this day to the fountain, to the well, right? It's the self same day. And it's pointed out that that expression, the Havo Hayom El Ayan, is four words. 
And in this, this famous work, Aura Gnus, The Hidden Light, it expresses that those four words are a permutation. If they look at the first letters, I have come this day to the fountain, Vavo, Ayom El Ayin, of Aleph, He, Vav, and He. It's just in a different permutation. They're just scrambled. That's the illusion that he uses that name in order to go do that. And of course, here it's to bring two people together. The, the heavens and the earth is like also like the masculine and the feminine. So to make a, a marriage, a match, is like matching the heavens and the earth, the male and the female in this particular case. And so to bring two people close to one another, which is something the Baal Shem Tov ultimately wanted to do, especially with all of his Ahavat Yisrael, his love of, of uh, fellow Jews. And even by extension, we could say that since this is a servant of Avram, who himself wasn't Jewish, and Avram had Ahavat Olam, the love of the entire world, that he wanted to connect not just all Jews, but everyone in the world together create closer and closer connections. And of course, all of the world to Hashem should be, should be connected. And this is the name that accomplishes it. Now, how, how did, what, what's the, the secret to being able to do that? Well, if we're too tethered to our physical body in an unrefined way, then the body seems uh, undeniably anchored in its locality, its situatedness in the here and now. But what's called his dakahut aguf, which is the refinement of the physical body, actually sort of dematerializes the body in some way. We can think of the, the connection between body and soul as the relationship between, uh, let's say, uh, tsura, which is like an abstract form or pattern, that would be the neshama or soul, and the homer, the materiality, the physicality of the actual body itself. That's the relationship. And what's most beautiful, and this carries out transculturally as well, um, is that the word for uh, father in, in uh, Latin is pater, from which we get father and pattern. And it happens to be in the Zohar that what's called mochim da Abba, the mentality of father, is just the tsura mohuti, the abstract pattern of information, which is the soul level that we have. Whereas in Latin, mater, mother, is where we also get the word matter and matrix from. So the materiality is the female component, and that's in the Zohar called mochim da ima. Like the consciousness of mother is the mater matter materiality and father is pattern and soul. So like the marriage of pattern, like an abstract pattern of information to a material body is what's going on. Now, what if we could just extract the pattern of information from the matter? Could we, could we then beam it somewhere like on star trek could we be beamed up right could we just beam your your pattern of information somewhere else and then rematerialize it somehow and the answer is maybe actually in science believe it or not and it has to do with turning the somethingness of being in a definite locale and definite location into a relative state of ion which is best translated as nothingness no thingness no particular thing so we have yesh is something, some specific thing that has qualities that have to do with its being in a state of locality. Uh, sometimes we say that that relates to what's called the zer anpin then kabbalah, which literally means the small face. And the small face of something is its situatedness. Classic situatedness has to do with like the, the, the secret of the week. That you have six days, which are related to what's called vav kitzavot or vak, there's six extremities of space, up, down, left, right, back and forth. So I have, I have three different spatial coordinates that I can define in my GPS. Up, down, left, right, back and forth are like my length, width and depth uh, dimensions. So six extremities, three dimensions in space. And those are actually the six days of the week because those are all days of tenua, of movement. I can move in any of those directions, my GPS coordinates. But Shabbat is rest. That's like the nodal point in the middle, the intersection of them all, and is sometimes also the secret of time. So the week actually is sort of like a spatialized concept of time. So what we call the small face is my particular GPS 
uh, uh, anchor that I have. So if I'm geotagged to like the here now, I have a date stamp and a geotag, that's this natural, like limited, small presentation of my smell, literally the small face. And then in, in a very, very deep section, the 76th chapter of, of, uh, uh, of a, 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 a abridged version of Eitz Chaim from the Arizal, one of the great, great Kabbalists. And this is a great uh, sort of uh, sh short version. It's the, it's, I, I'm tempted to say it's the spark notes version of Eitz Chaim, but that really doesn't adequately describe what it's like. So in this 76th chapter of this work called Chaste David, which is a, uh, a hyper condensed version of this famous work called Eitz Chaim, uh, 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 from the teachings of the Arizal, literally means the tree of life. So he talks about how we start with this sense of being restricted to the location, our ge geotag coordinates. And then by virtue of an elevated state of consciousness, we actually have what are called Gimel Aliot, three elevations that happen on, on Shabbat by observing the Sabbath. And one happens during the evening meal of Shabbat, another one during the day, and then the afternoon meal that you have three different elevations. And if you elevate three levels, you go from what's called Zer Anpin, the small face being localized, being local, to what's called Arech Anpin, literally the long face, which would really mean the, the macrocosm, so the global. So we have to somehow be able to change if we're going to go into a, uh, a Shabbos, Shabbat, Sabbath consciousness. We're ascending from the local to the global in some way, which is opening things up. And we do that specifically by entering into this state of nothingness, no specific thingness that happens. And uh, so the Arizal says as follows, if you take these words, I have come this day to the fountain. And the secret of those four words is all hitting at this, this name that allows for you to control space and time. If you, if you take those words and you add them up, they're equal to 237 is their numerical value. It's all a mathematical illusions. The Arizal loves sort of math games that are going on in the Torah. It says, if you take the word ayin, Ayan means, again, nothingness, no thingness. So normally it's just spelled Aleph, Yud, and Nun, which would be 1, 10, and 50, or 61 total in its expression. But he says, if you want to fully express no thingness, like you, you've turned into just abstract information, if you want to use a sci-fi characterization, you've completely stripped off your materiality or refined your materiality into just pure abstract information. So if you're going to fill that out, he says you literally fill out these three Hebrew letters as you would sound them out. So Aleph is a single Hebrew letter. Its numerical value is one. But if you pronounce it, it actually evokes two other letters. So Aleph. It's Aleph, Lamet, and Pe, or Fe. So the expanded, like articulating, given full expression to the letter Aleph, invites two other letters along with it. So now instead of just equaling one, Aleph is one, but the Lamet that you add in is 30, and the Fe at the end, or the Pe, is another 80, so it's 111. And same thing for the next letter, the Yud. Yud is Yud Vav Dalit. So it's three letters equal 20, and then Nun is Nun Vav Nun is 106. So altogether, the expanded form of nothingness equals 237, which is the same thing as I've come this day to the fountain, this name that has to do with teleportation. So the whole key is just to strip everything down into pure abstract information. It's de dematerialized in some way. So actually the brother of Yehuda Leib of Anaholi, or of Zusha of Anaholi, he has, he has a famous work where he talks about righteous individuals who are able to literally like strip off their material bodies transport themselves to a faraway place and then rematerialize their bodies. He actually describes this over 230 years ago in, in printed texts. It didn't wait for Gene Roddenberry and, and, and Star Trek to, uh, to come up with this. Now, it, it sounds wonderful, but is there any basis of this really in science? And um, what we find is that in 1935, uh, three Jewish scientists, uh, Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky, former 
formulated something called as the EPR paradox, which suggested that one of the weird uh, aspects of quantum mechanics was that um, it would allow for what Einstein termed spooky action at a distance. That things that uh, normally shouldn't have any ability to communicate one, with one another because they're too far away. Even a signal traveling at the speed of light couldn't make contact one from the next. Nonetheless, could be instantly connected one to the next uh, through this particular uh, process that's uh, uh, sort of hinted at, at in the EPR paradox. And, and Einstein didn't like this at all. He actually wanted to disprove this. He thought it was totally nuts in the universe. Flash forward a little bit in the 1960s, Irish physicist John Bell formulates what's known as the, the Bell theorem of non-locality. He, he sets this on an even firmer mathematical foundation. And then in 1972, and then even more in the 1980s with Alain Espé, um, the first uh, quantum teleportation experiments uh, were actually uh, occurring in the world. And if you want like just a simple, there are many ways of getting at this. I'd need like a semester long course to do the whole thing, but to just give you a, a teaser trailer to it, if you will, if you were to take, let's say a cesium atom and juice it, you give it a little bit of uh, electricity. So now the electrons that are in there are, are like, like holding it in this extra uh, uh, energy that they don't like. So they wanna, they wanna go through a process known as decay. Uh, they wanna go back to their comfort level, not like holding it in with this extra energy. And in order to decay, they have to release something to do that. And they release that um, excess in the form of two photons, which are particles of light that are entangled, meaning they're basically one object that's split in two places in the universe. And theoretically, you could send one a thousand light years in one direction, a thousand year, light years in the other direction, and they would be uh, instantaneously connected to one another such that if I measured the state of one of them, it would affect what would happen with the other one instantaneously. So not even at the speed of light. This is even more sort of mind blowing as a teleportation uh, uh, process. And to date, actually, the teleportation distance record which has actually been accomplished um, from outer space to, to planet Earth is, a two, is an 870 mile distance record. That's the, further, the furthest teleportation has occurred all using entangled photons. What's even stranger though, is that you can actually entangle particles that have never met, which is even crazier. It's like saying my future is somehow entangled with your past even if we never directly interact it with one another. Because the universe is so deeply interconnected that we're only starting now to appreciate this. This is the ultimate death of, death of distance. That's playing both on space and time, which is totally wondrous and, and, uh, and miraculous to, uh, to contemplate. And of course, there's too much to really get into in the, in the span of just this, this one talk. And I wanna leave some time for questions, but I also wanna give a concrete example of uh, time travel uh, as well. Uh, the Baal Shem Tov would say that uh, time travel is really a function of where your thoughts are. In fact, there's a recent book, and I actually, in my mad desk, I, I seem to have misplaced. Oh, here it is right here. Here we go. This is a book called Your Brain is a Time Machine, The Neuroscience and Physics of Time. Now, so um, I found it in this madness of all these books, um, suggests that we're able to affect also time travel. And it has something to do with the secret of consciousness itself. Of course, through memory and anticipation, the brain is wondrously able to time travel. There have been neuroscience experiments where a person's about to be surprised and there's no signaling that's going on. It's, it's like a total double blind experiment. There's no way they can know they're about to be surprised. And yet there's already a spike in activity in those brain regions that are reactive um, before there could be any awareness that uh, uh, you're about to be surprised. So we see bizarre elements of mental time travel all the time. The question is like, how radical can that, can that go? Of course, there are theories that maybe the brain functions like a quantum computer and quantum mechanics. There's uh, something called CTP symmetries, which means subatomic particles amongst other things don't observe a difference between past and future. 
And we see wonderful examples of this as an Israeli physicist, Yakir Aronoff's dual wave theory, or what he sometimes calls a two-state vector formalism, if you want to look that one up on Wikipedia. It basically means that as much as that you're past can be causing what's happening to you right now in the present. There's simultaneously, from a quantum mechanical standpoint, there are things happening from the future that are coming back to where you are into the past. Uh, and, our, and, our, and the intersection, the present is actually the intersect of a wave of influence from the past and a wave of influence from the future. So what I will do tomorrow is impacting what I'm doing right now, so, amazingly, according to this idea. There are also what are called delayed choice experiments, where you can actually see subatomic particles travel backwards in time and like pick door number two instead of door number one as they go through an obstacle course. An example would be the Scully experiment. And all these things have been replicated many times in laboratories. Um, so there are, there are crazy questions going on right now with time travel. And I'll just leave you with this before I take some questions. There's a famous statement that Moshe Rabbeinu is in the Gemara in the Tanit, in the tractate having to do with uh, fast in the Talmud, says that, uh, that uh, Moses, that he ascends on high. Most of the translators say he just goes up to heaven. But we know that this heaven and earth phenomenon doesn't just literally mean heaven and earth. They're like different states of consciousness that are now connecting together. So he goes up to the, the higher level consciousness, we'll call it the heaven consciousness, and we'll say that that's non-local, where you can touch anywhere and any when, any time and any place. And it's a leap. Pesach, Passover, really means dilug, kvitzah, to jump. So it's jumping over time and space in some very radical sense. So this jumping over time and space he's doing by reaching this elevated state of consciousness on the earth, he's localized. When he goes to the heavens, he's non-local, so he can plug into this. And he basically time travels not into the past, which is easier in a way because the past has already happened, right? He time travels into the future to where Rabbi Akiva is teaching in the yeshiva, and he's a little bit perplexed by what's going on. Then he gets uh, a sense of relief when at the very end of the talk, Rabbi Akiva says that this is uh, Mimosha Mesinai. This is something that comes from Moses himself from Mount Sinai. Uh, so there's actually a, a concrete example in the Talmud, at least one that we can mention right now, that relates to a time travel episode. So I would suggest to you that it's a sign that we're closer to the ultimate and complete redemption that, first of all, even in science fiction literature, looking at, let's say, uh, the Time Machine as a sci-fi novel from H.G. Wells in 1895 and, and many other texts that have come out uh, subsequent to that, that because time travel and also teleportation have become very dominant themes in popular culture and in science fiction, that there's something very deep about that that goes into the Torah. So we want to be able to access all of time and also all of space to finally overcome the limits of the ultimate Egypt, which is even of the, the finitude of the world. And so with that, I wanna make sure that I get some questions in. And I'll just mention, because there's so much material I didn't get to, um, that if you're so interested on Torah Cafe, if you Google my name, um, you will find that there's a talk, a variation of this talk with mostly different material from what I got. I covered some of it, but there's so much more. So you can pick up on more if you didn't uh, get some things uh, clear or you just want to cover more ground that I didn't get into today in that talk. But maybe we can, uh, I thank you so much for having me. I, I look very, very forward to uh, addressing uh, the body 2.0. And a lot of what I do as a technology futurist is relates in the biotech sphere. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, gene editing and stem cells and uh, nanomedicine and all kinds of bizarre, crazy stuff uh, that's, that's also alluded to in, in wonderful uh, uh, places within Torah literature. So I'll, I'll open it up to some questions. All right, amazing. Before, before, to, before we get to the questions, I just want to um, thank you, Rabbi Crisp, for an, an incredibly mind-blowing and eye-opening presentation. Also, very, very important to mention a thank you to um, Jody and Josh Wittenberg for helping sponsor uh, this series and this event. Thank you, uh, Josh. And thank you, Jody. Really appreciate it. All right. I know I have questions. Um, I'm sure you have questions, and I saw that there were some questions in the chat. So please um, 
uh, you know what? I'm going to start mentioning questions from the chat. When you mentioned about um, Einstein's teachings regarding um, regarding gravity and how that's kind of like a, a the fabric sinking in, I've seen I've seen YouTube videos that illustrate it kind of with like a a heavy ball falling into uh, like a mattress or, or a blanket or something, and it's kind of warping the actual fabric of space itself. Um, the question was asked, if the moon is warped around the earth, can we change the warp to make it spin differently, perhaps thereby speeding up or slowing down time, uh, which would then make a day slower or quicker than 24 hours? Is that something that is on the horizon? Right, so that, that would require uh, like technological advances that are really beyond us right now. Uh, the closest thing that we could foreseeably see in the near nearer term future would be using three plus one numerical relativity to warp space around a small object like a spaceship in order to move through space by basically cheating on the, the uh, speed of light. Um, and you could affect time. The ultimate affecting of, of this is going to be uh, uh, affecting space and time is to be able to, you know, traverse these distances faster. So you go back to when the Tanya was printed in 1796 and, you know, you're, you're traveling by horse at 11 miles an hour. You know, you look at uh, uh, the latest mission to Mars with the Mars rover that just landed that traveled tens of millions of miles and at speeds in the tens of thousands of miles per hour. But the fastest we've ever been able to measure uh, an entanglement like moving through space is basically where you're moving without moving. That's actually a Shabbat experience. The ultimate, the reason you're not allowed to travel, this is one of the deepest things. Most of the stuff we're not allowed to do technologically on the Sabbath are because the technologies are not advanced enough yet. But the, the really the only way you're allowed to move on, on the, the Sabbath beyond the tomb, the domain of 2000 amot around your, the, it's like limited distance around where you're, you're located uh, on the Sabbath is to move without ever moving. So the question is like, can I be totally at rest and also moving instantaneously anywhere? Well, that's what's suggested by this. And that's, that's why actually, and this is very beautiful uh, and providential gematria or mathematical illusion, that if you look at the word Shabbat in Hebrew, it equals 702, which miraculously is the gematria of mechonat makom, which really means like a space machine or a teleportation machine. And actually the, 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 the term for the mitzvot in the Torah, taryag, we have 613 commandments in the Torah. Every mitzvah is about safta v'chib, or to bind and connect. It's about making connections. The one who does like, the, like tons and tons of connections, that's the connector in chief, the tzaddik, the righteous one. So that, that in Gematria 613 is mechonat zman. It, it's a time machine. So we have something very deep that's going on. Now, obviously we could dispense with these mathematical like illusions and still get the core concepts over. The, the idea of every time you lay down in the universe, a mitzvah, a, a good deed in the Torah, a commandment, a performative, depending upon how you wanna translate it in context, you're really laying down a connection. Once you have a critical mass of connections, you now have a net, well, you've networked the whole universe together and you can start to see all kinds of emergent phenomena that happen. And part of that is that a, a mitzvah, a commandment is nitzchi. What you do, the positive is an eternal quality. So it's really kind of beyond time, which allows you to manipulate time. Through being able to do that, you also have a connection because it relates very deeply. Uh, sometimes can they get all the mitzvot or corresponding to all the mitzvot is just the keeping of the Sabbath, which is our teleportation machine, if you will, which is moving without moving. I'm totally at rest. I don't go anywhere. It's just the distance that appears to be between me and you or between one place and another place is complete illusion. There's no dover nifrat. There's nothing truly separate. So in, in like distance is complete illusion when you're in a Shabbos conscious. So the very notion I'd have to travel somewhere is already like, uh, is, is highly, highly problem, problematic for Shabbat. So like we have some of these technologies that we're developing spiritually speaking, 
concurrently with maybe developing them also in, in terms of physics and ordinary technology. Thank you for, um, for explaining that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I, I wanna get to, if you have another few minutes, I wanna get to a few yeah. questions that we'll do sure. live. I just wanna make a comment, something that struck me and I see here in the chat, somebody asked about the significance of ion with the Miloy, with the, with the, the fill in letters um, equaling 237, which you explained is the, is the um, it's connected to the, uh, um, uh, I believe to- I've, I've come this day to the fountain. But right, I the idea about Fitzah Derech and, and, and moving, but I think it all touches on the same point. And, and, and Rabbi, tell me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think one of the major, for me, one of the major takeaways is that the more we let go, the more we're connected, right? The more we discard, Beautiful. the more Beautiful. we let go, the more we dis, um, disintegrate self almost, the more we touch on the universal and we can connect with the things that would otherwise be impossible. In other words, so long as we're holding on to what we have and who we are, then we're very limited to what we have and who we are. When we can let go of that, the ayin, the nothingness, allows us to touch on, uh, to really touch on the infinite. Um, that's that's one of my, that's maybe a, a very simplistic takeaway. <laughs> that's for me, that's that's a takeaway. So can um, I, maybe can I comment just on that for a moment? Please. Like, yeah, so, so uh, interestingly, there's something we call in neuroscience transient hypofrontality which is basically the regions, the prefrontal regions of the neocortex, which relate to our sense of self and also our sense of uh, inside versus outside. You know, what's part of me, what's not part of me. Um, those all go offline, they disappear, they shut down when I'm in a state that's called transient hypofrontality or flow. And interestingly in flow, where I actually lose all sense of self, I can accomplish amazing things at an amazing speed. In general, you can do five times as much. Like this is what's been charted and worked by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi at the University of Chicago. You can do at least five times as much in the same amount of time. One hour is like five hours. One day is like five days. So if you spent five days in flow without a sense of self, like we'll call this bital hayesh or the best translation in, in modern day psychological vocabulary would be the transcendence of the ego or transient hypofrontality. You just lose that self-awareness. You merge such that action and intention are one. You're at one with what you're doing. And then you can have this acceleration in what you're able to achieve. Higher than that, there's something called bital mitziut which would be like transcending or nullifying rea the construct of reality, which is primarily space-time. Such that I even, even it's now it's not even just about me and ego psychology, it's now the, the, in, the larger environment encompassing me can also be transcended and that I, that I can start to morph space-time and warp them in important ways and maybe altogether vault over them, to jump over them to jump beyond the limitations of space-time or pace up. Incredible, incredible. All right, let's get to a few questions. If you have another few minutes, let's get to uh, maybe two or three questions. Um, who is, who would like to have a question? Richard. Yes. Richard, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I wanna, I wanna start off by saying, excellent talk. I, I, I wanna just not pretend that I understood a whole lot of it. I just have to be very honest. Uh, but I do have a, a very naive question, if you'll forgive me for this. You mentioned something about particles uh, being mixed up to excess energy, and it had to be let go to, to bring it back to a certain state of mass stagnation, a certain state of, of beforehood. Before. I, I'm wondering if that could be used in medicine at a future time to take whatever is wrong in a human body and spell it uh, so that it goes back to before to a normal state of health. And that's just curious. So uh, one of the, my favorite areas to discuss when it, it comes to the biomedical fields is this fledgling um, uh, study of what's called quantum biology, which is suggesting that scaling laws that normally are discounted when your primary object is either the level of a cell or the level of a molecule that makes up a cell can now be reduced further to looking at atomic and even subatomic objects and their impact at the cellular level. 
if we look at quantum biology, then what you're saying may have some, some very deep significance to it. And there, there are, and I'll probably get into a little bit of that, uh, at least touch upon it next week. Uh, some of the really outrageous experience, which are uh, experiments that are going and some of which are frankly stranger than fiction um, that are happening in real labs around the world today. It's kind of exciting. Yeah, one of the generic question, if I just real quickly can answer yes or no. Uh, since all this technology can be used for good or, or evil or bad, uh, how do you see this playing out? Because we're still human, we still have flaws and it can be used from some really wonderful and really Horrific things. I'm scary, scary, just really scary things. Okay, that's it. Uh, absolutely. I often get, I often talk, uh, uh, I often get asked that question, and sometimes do separate talks about the promise and peril of all of these insane technologies that I deal with on a regular basis. And there are, it is true, there are both, which is why we need the Torah as a as a system of guidance that tells us that not everything that can be done should be done. So we don't realize some sci-fi dystopic future and we can shepherd these things into, you know, uh, 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 a type of future that we and our, our offspring want to inhabit. So that's really, really important. The Torah likewise gives us tremendous guidance on to how to use these things for the promise and not, and to avoid the peril. Very, very critical. Yeah, that's, that's great. All right, let's see if we could do one more question. All right, who's got a question? Uh, I have a question, Rabbi. Yes. Um, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering if you have any familiarity with this um, this theory that I, I've been kind of looking into uh, recently with uh, Roger Penrose and uh, Stuart Hemroth with the Orc OR uh, theory of uh, consciousness. It's, you know, um, Rabbi, have you heard anything about that with, uh, in terms of the quantum, this theory about the quantum uh, basis for, for consciousness, uh, you know, in, in the universe, in, in matter in particular, but in, in, uh, especially in, in the, you know, within the human brain? Yeah, so absolutely. And that's why, for instance, the Baal Shem Tov says, it's like if you're going to affect any of these things, it's very, it's our, it's very much bound up with consciousness itself, which is a big, it still remains very elusive. Like we might say, the three great secrets uh, that are are pursued in science um, and that remain ever elusive are the secret of time, the secret of life, and the secret of consciousness. And they kind of progress in that level in terms of like stacking complexity. Um, and I'm, a, I'm somewhat of a fan of Penrose's uh, Emperor's New Mind and the, the uh, uh, quantum mechanical uh, understanding of consciousness. I do a lot with neuroscience and that would be like really uh, something for a, a, a full length talk presentation. Um, but there's a lot to that. We likewise could say that uh, call Yisrael Erevim Zebezeh, all Jews are usually understood as being guarantors one for the next, but Erevim comes from the word Irbuvia, it's like actually means entanglement, we're all entangled with one another, like one body with one heart, so it means like somehow our consciousness is such that I'm able to be experiencing something going on in your world, your life, and vice versa. And, and we, there's, there's like a lot of uh, evidence to support this today in the world that we have, uh, uh, our consciousness is not just something locked into our own brain, uh, but actually is like a kind of mental radio, which by the way is a book that, that uh, Einstein wrote an introduction to from uh, uh, Upton Sinclair called Mental Radio, um, that, that it's, it's, it's reaching out to other people and that you can have this spooky action at a distance through consciousness itself, especially if the underlying principles of consciousness are quantum, which also in a weird way dematerializes the brain back into what we might call the mind, which is like opposed to the sort of strict materialistic view of a lot of neuroscience that we have today. Anyway, huge question. Would love to give about six hours <laughs> response on just that. But yes, I am a, a, a enthusiast is, for is, is, there, is there an overlap though 
with in in, in in his perception or with the Kabbalah's perception in that uh, the divine somehow can can be that orchestrating uh, force that uh, that is uh, is orchestrating the quantum um, manifestation of consciousness. Like can I, I, can, can yeah. God be the thing that that orchestrates that moment to moment quantum uh, notion of consciousness? So that gets into questions of free will and determinism, amongst other things. And of course, one of the big things that changes with the advent of quantum mechanics is what's called the probabilistic turn in science, which seems to open the possibility of free will because we just can calculate probabilities now. Also implies that we are uh, in a, um, a co-creative environment where our states of consciousness help to uh, uh, finalize or concretize the phenomena that we experience in the world around us, that we live in a participatory universe, or sometimes what's referred to as anthropic cosmological principle. Also huge topic, more than I can probably take on in a short question, but awesome. And that, that is sometimes I do sometimes get into that in, in uh, talks at, at greater length to do justice to it. So. Great, great right. Question. So we, we won't ask you to do the whole presentation now, but I see already in the comments we have folks that that are that cannot get enough of this. I personally am I'm in that camp. But the good news is we have at least next week before <laughs> we surprise you with more <laughs> before we discuss um, more opportunities. Before you go, can I ask you a question? I've heard and you tell me if I'm if I'm if I'm uh, this is this is not on the direct topic of tonight. I've heard that you have an extensive collection of books and manuscripts. Is that uh, is that indeed correct? Uh, according to my son, there's seventeen thousand books in the library. Got and it. And they go back not, to not the library, your library, right? My, my my library, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice. and then they they go back to 1489. Okay, I was going to ask. And is that is that 1489? Is that a Jewish text? Yeah, yeah. But although definitely, I have all kinds of texts that are not just. Uh, I, I, there's a very large number of of Jewish texts, but there are a lot of other things here too. Especially, I'm very interested in the impact of Jewish thought and Kabbalah in particular on the development of science, including Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Wolfgang Pauli, and many many others that we could talk about. So I've, I've tried to, uh, like the reference to Benjamin Franklin, of course, known also for his scientific pursuits. And he was a Freemason, was very steeped in uh, all kinds of occult literature, including Kabbalah. I like to trace those things. So a lot of the, uh, the library here is uh, designed to, to try to uh, 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 provide textual evidence for where that stuff got it. occurs. Got it, got it, got it. Um, that's... Uh... I think everything that you say is evoking more, um, more, uh, more ideas. One, one thing that somebody just texted me now, um, he said that Tzemach Tzedek, who's the third Chabad Rebbe, said that when a person helps someone else, one can and takes away time from their own learning of Torah, one's own study of Torah is enhanced one thousand times, which would seem otherwise impossible until you realize that when you leave yourself. To be there for someone else, that the kind of deconstruction of self, yeah. perhaps we then touch on something much greater, which then is kind of like that flow experience of uh, touching on the beyond. But yeah. just just sharing what somebody uh, just just literally just a second shared with to make a that, that that by way also has been one of Cheek Sent Me High's students at the University of Chicago did a whole study of what's called group flow, which actually verified that 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 there's something like that is in fact the case. We don't even know how to measure the full extent of it, but we actually have seen that uh, helping others is huge, huge, uh, so, such a huge facet actually of one's own achievement and performance that they're now what are called deliberately developmental corporations that split a person's performance evaluation half into what they do in their own and half how much they help others within the company in recognition of exactly this thing. So it's actually like spilling into the mainstream, both in academia and in the business world. All right, um, Rabbi, this has been incredible. We have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to think about now, all of us. And I can't wait till next week. Remember next week, same bad time, same bad channel. 
We are going to explore the idea of body regeneration, body 2.0, reversing aging, healing the body, and the incredible Kabbalistic secrets and scientific secrets that, uh, that, that, that intertwine on that. All right, we'll see you all next week. See you hopefully before then as well. Have a wonderful evening, Rabbi Chris. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Talk you so you. much. All Have right. Have a great week, everyone. Take care. Shabbat everybody.